Hello there, I'm Reverend Yin, founder of Evolving Enneagram. If you've been seeking a compassion-based, contemplative approach to Enneagram inner work, you are certainly in the right place. This is where contemplation meets the Enneagram. We are in week 46 of a 52-week Sunday talk series based on the book by Orrin J. Sofer, Your Heart Was Made for This. And this week, our theme is compassion fatigue around the Enneagram. So this week and next week, the theme of the book is compassion. So today I'd like to explore this in two parts. First, I'd like to define our terms as we always do, uh, and then talk about compassion and what I mean by compassion fatigue. And then in part two, I'd like to explore some tips for avoiding compassion fatigue around the circle of the Enneagram. So let's begin. So of course, I always like to begin with defining our terms and, and how we hold the terms matter because I really feel like what we mean by compassion, maybe what we were taught was compassion, um, is something that might not be compassion and is actually something that is causing us uh, undue uh undue hardship and struggle and suffering because we might equate what seems like compassion uh, with self-sacrifice in ways that are harmful to our being. And so what do we mean by compassion? Today, I want to use Sofer's definition, and he defines it as a stable, caring attitude oriented toward alleviating suffering. So we'll talk about this in a bit, but I love how he combines there's a passive and active element in here. There's an internal attitudinal element and a behavioral element in here. So Sofer adds, compassion allows us to receive pain and respond skillfully. It is a strong, balanced tenderness that helps us to stay steady in the face of hurt instead of turning away, lashing back, seeking someone to blame, or numbing out. So to be clear, compassion is not the same thing as pity or sympathy, which I really equate with like coming from on high. When you pity someone, there's a superiority with that. Um, the word compassion, uh, the etymology of it is that passio comes from the Latin to suffer, and then calm uh, comes from the Latin uh, word that means with. So to suffer with is like literally where it comes from. And so it's also not the same thing exactly as empathy. Uh, and that is important. And for a little bit more information about empathy, I'll put a link to uh, a talk earlier this year I did based on Sofer's book and based on his chapter on empathy. So just subtle distinctions. Compassion as Sofer presents it, and I do like this, uh, has a passive, again, as well as active element. And I'm going to, again, share some really beautiful uh, words that uh, Sofer offers us about compassion. Compassion instead, and he's contrasting this with pity, compassion instead touches pain with mercy. It's engaged strong and available. Rooted in tenderness, it embraces hurt with love. Compassion, like aspiration, includes a twofold process. Its receptive component feels trembling with care, while its active component responds, asking, how can I help? With compassion, we stand securely on dry land, offering an outstretched hand to another who is drowning in the water. Wow, I love this definition. It really speaks to my heart and it, it speaks to something I will openly admit happened uh, the week after the elections. Just, it's just a little trigger. It wasn't like a major thing like it might've been in the past. But in the midst of like the suffering and challenge that was going on um, among many in my proximity, if you will, just a little bit, I got this trigger um, 
based on old wounding, based on very much a, my type three egoic structure that didn't used to make any space for feelings, sadness, um, for people being blown over by by their feelings. I think that's the important piece to mention here because the, the wounding for me is, oh, you guys get to cry, but I'm the ones who have to do the work. You know, I'm the one who has to then get up and do the work because others can't get up and do the work. And so it's sort of like that as if, and then the old me would be doing the work, but not necessarily from a heartfelt place of compassion, right? So the gift that I understand now is that allowing space for the feelings both around me and within me help to inspire attitudinally, not just as cold, efficient action, which might happen, but without the heart that is vital for true, skillful, compassionate action, right? That, that all of that gets to be included, right? But the idea is that um, what got triggered for me is when, when it looks like everyone's drowning, I automatically feel like I can't cry or I can't, I can't struggle right now because someone has to do, get up and do something. Right. And, and I know that not to be true now. I know that there's something bigger happening, that there's space for all of it. And in fact, again, that the emotional um, release and, uh, uh, and embrace of what is happening is actually vital. So in this case, I leaned into people's feelings, even then started going to poetry events so that my heart would, I wouldn't just go to figuring out what to do, but instead stay for a while longer and allow the feelings to like permeate me so that I could access my own. So by that, uh, I personally felt more open to the softness of what I think is the heart of compassion. So, yeah. Whew. And so related to that, what is a compassionate response? People often ask and, and ask aloud uh, with me, of me. And I think that the fact that Sofer's book puts compassion this far along, I mean, week 46 people, right? Uh, and in his description, he references wisdom, which we talked about equanimity. I already talked about empathy. And we have this modern desire for the quick fix or solution when what we're doing in Evolving Enneagram, I hope, is cultivating qualities of being that when a moment arises, enables us to most skillfully respond to it, to respond with compassion as we've been cultivating it, right? And, and to then also in this moment, if you're like, oh shoot, I haven't been here for you know the year, but just taking a moment to recognize within your own life and even to take an opportunity now to go, how is wisdom impacting this? How is a sense of balance and equanimity impacting this? Am I just dropping into a space of, of uh, Oh well, this is this is perfect. This, I'm going to move into you know compassion fatigue where where I'm not able to respond again, not from a place of judging myself, but a place of discernment to help me understand how to navigate this better. Right. So going into that um, compassion fatigue, which uh, some of you already know, isn't really compassion. There's a term that's been used. Uh, in, in recent years, especially in caregiving professions. Uh, and it's called compassion fatigue because it feels like compassion, but really uh, experts are now calling it empathetic distress. So it's not actually compassion. It's where it is, it is where we it, let ourselves drown with what's happening. So again, Sofer's words here, when receiving more pain and suffering than we can manage, we slide into depression and overwhelm if compassion becomes unbalanced. On the active side, if we reach out to help but lose our center, we may topple over and fall into the suffering. And again, he says, caregiving professionals sometimes call this compassion fatigue, exhaustion and burnout from repeated exposure to an unmanageable amount of pain and suffering. Both Buddhist traditions and social sciences assert that true compassion doesn't fatigue us. 
So it's really important to say, losing perspective, we become preoccupied with another's pain, identify with it as our own and may withdraw out of self-protection. Empathic distress distorts our vision and can sink us into helplessness, compelling us to believe we can't improve things. Instead of taking action, we become paralyzed and end up doing nothing. To stay engaged and heal our relationships, community, and world, we must learn to distinguish compassion from its decoys that sap our strength and leave us stranded. So, yeah. So with that... I want to share, move into part two and share just a few tips around the circle to help us to avoid compassion fatigue. I want to start by saying, please, I hope that you do not use, oh, like, oh, yes, I have compassion fatigue as another reason to beat yourself up. This is all about discernment and deepening our understanding of like, oh, if anything, it's actually having compassion for how we, we uh, have been modeled ways of being in the world and have taken on ways of being in the world that actually increase suffering, that your suffering is important to, to alleviate, right? And so today I wanna to focus on the points around the circle of the Enneagram rather than the types as well, because I think all these reminders um, are important to all of us. And sometimes the advice, um, even for at our stress point uh, might even be of greater value than that of our core point, especially when we're in a place of overwhelm, right? And and so, and then I wanted to do it from the high side because I recognize that some of you are not in that place. Some of you are standing squarely on the shore right now. And, and so we wanna hold that that place in that stance with an open in an open hearted way not to not to say that you have to be the one holding it for everyone you know but just saying that we always alternate and some of us find ourselves sinking at some moments and others who are on the shore can, can be of support but don't jump in and, and sink with them so i want to invite you to just take a moment right now cuz we've been in a head space and i want you to uh take an opportunity to just Breathe for a moment, feeling your heart space. This is compassion, after all, that we're talking about. Ah, yeah. And so here now, at the high side of point one, we remember that compassion isn't always about hard work. Sometimes, not always. It isn't always about hard work or even doing what we think is the right thing. Sometimes just by dropping our shoulders, unclenching the jaw, softening our gaze, we bring forth what is most needed for good to flourish, our flexibility and our presence. <sighs> At the high side of point two, we remember that compassion isn't the same as pity or sympathy, which puts us above human neediness or pain rather than included within it. Sometimes just by listening silently with the spirit of me too, we receive our own compassion as much as we give it. At the high side of point three, we remember that compassion isn't always or only about what we can do to alleviate suffering. Sometimes it is about collapsing and allowing what, what might be years of our own unaddressed grief bring us to our knees. And I might be saying this one from personal experience. And at the high side of point four, breathing, we remember that compassion isn't about being vested in suffering. Continue, yours or another's, because it feels more real than joy. Sometimes compassion is also about getting up and doing for to show care or to work toward a better world. Hmm, at the high side of point five, we remember that compassion doesn't always involve helping to solve problems and find answers. Sometimes it is about sitting with yourself or others and holding hands in, ag in the agony of not knowing or of not being able to find a solution or a cure. Hmm. 
Yeah. At the high side of point six, we remember that compassion isn't just about concern and danger prevention. Sometimes it is about being grounded in what is real while acting from a place of hopeful vision. At the high side of point seven, we remember that compassion isn't just about helping to cheer or uplift everyone. Sometimes it is about sitting with tears until the tears fill an ocean that carries you all to a new harbor. At the high side of point eight, we remember that compassion isn't always about doing for or doing on behalf of others, especially not just the others who seem to be on your side. Sometimes it's realizing with great, great tenderness that love really takes no sides. And at the high side of point nine, we remember that compassion isn't just about empathy. It's definitely not about getting lost in someone else's pain by merging with them. But remember that nine's first response regarding any requested action is typically no. <laughs> Sometimes compassion is about the love and bravery it takes to get out of your comfort zone, to stand up, to take engaged action, to say yes. Much love to you all. I will see you. Oh, I was going to say I'll see you next week, but we have a YouTube live today, Sunday, uh, November 17th at 12 to 1 o'clock Central Time, CST. So hopefully I will, well, I won't see you, but hopefully I'll hear you in the chat later today as I join Christina and we talk about welcoming prayer and keeping the heart open. So it's all on theme here and it's a practice to support you. We'll do a guided meditative practice as part of the YouTube live happening. Uh, and if you are listening to this after the 17th, know that the YouTube live will be recorded and should be on our channel even afterwards. So much love and compassion to all of you. Namaste.